Raise your little baby from the dead, you'd be shouting glorifying God, I'll tell you right now, amen. All that are in the grave shall hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. He has power to raise the dead. If he can raise the dead, folks, he can save your soul. Turn to the book of Ephesians with me tonight, please. Chapter 1, if you'd like to stand as we open the book. The church at Ephesus, the Apostle Paul addresses it. This is what's called the heart of the Pauline epistles. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. It gets down to the very nitty-gritty of what we're all about. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 1, to the church at Ephesus, Ephesians 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed, in himself. Father, bless this book now. Give me what you'd have me say from it tonight and glorify thy name. In Jesus' name we pray, man. You can be seated. Some of you have heard me say it before, but it bears saying again. One of the most remarkable places I've ever been in my life. It impressed me so much that I've, I stood in awe when I walked down streets 2,000 years old. I have been to Ephesus. And it's one of the most remarkable things in the fact because you can walk down the street as exactly as it was at the time of the Apostle Paul and the writing to the church at Ephesus. You can go to the very arena where for hours they screamed, as great is Diana of the Ephesians. And I remember standing there and some of our brethren with us, I think, got up on the stage or got up on the, uh, got up on the, uh, up, uh, on the arena part of the seats and one or two of them shouted out, Great is Christ our Lord, Amen, <laughs> instead of Diana of the Ephesians. Tonight that arena lies silent. No longer do you have hundreds, yea, thousands, screaming to the top of their lungs that Diana is great. But the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is preached around the globe long after the Apostle Paul stood at that place at Ephesus. I looked at Ephesus and saw some things that reminded me of what kind of people these were 2,000 years ago. These were despots. These were, these were pagan people. They were barbaric in a lot of ways. Though on one hand they were civilized, they have a huge library. Directly at the end of the road, they were still pagan and lost without God. And they did not know the Lord. And in those days, folks, pagan meant open paganism. It meant practicing in public what they wanted, what they were. It meant displaying it face in your face. It meant that it, in those days, no holes barred, that anything went. And that's the way it was in Ephesus. To be called an Ephesian was kind of like being called a Corinthian. It wasn't a very good thing at all. But the apostle carried the word of God into Ephesus and he began to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to the church at Ephesus, why he chose this church, I do not know. But to the church at Ephesus, he raises us off into some of the most lofty of thoughts and ideas in the mind of God. For he carries us off into the very heart and purpose of the Almighty. I want to call your attention to verses 7 through 11 that we just read. If you look carefully, you have the word show up, which is in verse number uh, 9, which he purposed in himself. Look at chapter number 2 and verse number 7 of the same book. That in the ages to come he might show the, ex the exceeding riches of his grace and kindness toward us, through Jesus Christ, chapter number 3 and verse number 11, the scripture says, According to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The apostle Paul uses two things over and over again in the letter to the church at Ephesus. He uses the word eternal and he uses the word purpose. 
There is a mind behind what's going on in this world today. Satan is free to do as he pleases, but he's only so free. Satan is wicked, but he can only do so much. Because the hand of God is staying him in what he is doing. And God has a reason for everything that's happening. So the Apostle Paul wants the church at Ephesus to understand that there was a battle going on, that there's a battle raging, that they can't even see with their eyes. But he tells them plainly in verses 22 through 20 through verse 23 of Ephesians 1. He said, he wrought in Christ, he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that one which is to come. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He begins to unfold for them the eternal purpose of God, that God has raised Christ from the dead. But when he raised him from the dead, he made a show of the powers of this earth openly. openly. The principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places were judged at the cross. And when the Lord arose from the dead, he showed them how much of their power had been taken from them. And when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, he ascended right up through the midst of their rank and file. And they began to understand that this lowly Galilean, this little babe that was born in Bethlehem of Judea, now was the Lord God Almighty with all power and might. And he rises right up through their midst and goes into the very presence of God. What he wants the church to understand is what the demons already know. The principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places understand fully the power of God. It is the Christian that comes to church every Sunday that does not have a clue of the nature of the battle that rages. The Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians chapter number 5 says that we do not war, we do not battle, we do not fight with weapons of flesh and, 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 and metal and things that we can make. He says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty unto God to the pulling down of strongholds. But in order for you to understand that, you have to understand what's going on in the real world, the world of the spirit, the world of the real battle, not flesh, but spirit. Follow me as we move along. And so there in chapter number one, the apostle Paul loads them up quickly. He loads up the church at Ephesus and says, everything that's happened is according to the eternal purpose of God. For he tells them in verse number 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. He will not be stopped in what he intends to do. He will not be stopped in what he intends to do. Whether you can understand fully, and I do not believe there is a man on the face of this earth that can truly wrap his mind completely around the doctrine of predestination and election. Because we do not fully know yet who all is as far as this election is concerned and this predestination. But we do know that he does choose that you were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And I believe that John Calvin was a madman. When John Calvin got up and taught people that you are either one of the elect or you're going to the pit. And only the elect are going to be saved. And therefore he clearly divided the whole creation into two camps. The elect and the rest of them. What he failed to understand is that not only is election a progressive thing, for it progressively, progressively reaches into new groups and people, but it is a thing that has to do with the mind of God as he works out what he intends to do with mankind in every generation. He will not be stopped. He worketh all things after the counsel of of his own will. I'm here tonight. Glory to God. Because of the will of God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I'm here saved tonight. 
because he interfered, he intervened, he stepped in to my life one day and got my attention. That's why I'm saved. I wasn't seeking God, he sought me. I didn't find him, he found me. Amen. <laughs> so in Ephesians 1, he prepares us for Ephesians 2. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse 1, he said, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. Watch carefully. There is no doubt about this. The individual being addressed in chapter 2 is a born again believer. Fact is, it's a, it's a body of believers. But in verse 2, he said, Where in time past... You walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. God has given us an ironclad way of knowing the children of God and the children of Satan. And the ironclad way of knowing that is not a bunch of mumbo jumbo that they give you out of their mouth when they quote some catechism or when they quote some belief in faith or even when they name the name of Jesus, the ironclad way that you can know if they are truly a child of God is by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit of the living God. And this is what he's going to get into here in just a moment. I hear people all the time talking about Jesus. I hear them singing to Jesus. I hear them praising Jesus. And then they're bed hopping and they're shooting their dope up. And they live like hell itself. And they're sorry low down and evil as anybody else in the world. Yet they can go to church and love Jesus. And sing about Jesus. Friend, don't be, don't be naive. Don't be foolish. It's not a bunch of words coming out of their mouth. It's the Holy Spirit that is not in them that should tell you whether they belong to the Lord or not. The Bible says plainly a tree is judged by the fruit it bears. And so therefore the Holy Spirit will witness with your spirit that we are the children of God. <laughs> and the spirit that is the Holy Spirit that is in the believer, this is important. The Holy Spirit that resides within you, if he is not wanting to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ that I preached about this morning, manifest his holy name, brag on him to high heaven, talk about him all the time, and what he's done, how he's defeated hell, how he arose from the dead, there's no other name but his name. If the Spirit in you does not want to do that, you've got the Spirit of hell in you. Amen. You're giving lip service to Jesus. Lip service to him. The other day when the president was speaking somewhere, I don't know where it was, but some fellow was out there and that fellow was saying, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Jesus is God. And he was saying it over and over and over again and I probably, he was saying it because he really believes it. But the people there, the group he was addressing, didn't like the idea that Jesus was God so they all started singing something. I wish I could remember what it was. Anybody in here saw that? Surely some of you saw it. They started singing together to drown out his voice. And they sang their meaningless nothing garbage. And then when they got through with it, Barack Obama looked at him and said, Well, Jesus is the Lord. That's what he said. That's what he said. No man can call him Lord but by the Holy Ghost. I'm trying to show you how to discern spirits tonight. If you don't discern spirit, you'll be fooled by everything that comes down the pike. Just because somebody gets up and says he loves Jesus, then it means talking about the Jesus that you know. For there is another Jesus. Now, if that man and that man that said Jesus is God, how many of you in here tonight believe Jesus is God? <laughs> I believe it full 100%. He's God. He's God Almighty. And yet they did not want to hear it. They drowned him out. He was one man against probably three, four, five hundred, a thousand, how many people were there, but they drowned him out. The Spirit witnesses with my spirit, we are the children of God. We're sons of God because of the one that's in us. And the one that is in us will know the one that's in you. Jesus I know. Paul I know. Who are you? <laughs> that's what they said, the demons did to the seven sons of Sceva, who became exorcists over there in the book of Acts. There is a spirit in you that is the ironclad mark of your salvation. So he said in Ephesians chapter number two, I, you have the quickened 
who were dead in trespasses and sins. When the Bible talks about dead, it's talking about your spiritual condition here. It's talking about how you are spiritually. It is saying that you are nothing but a natural man. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are absolutely, completely, fully dead to anything of the Spirit of God. You can sing. You can even get up and read scripture. You can be in the choir. You can teach Sunday school, play instruments, sing specials, hand out tracts, stand on the street corner. But if you do not have the Lord Jesus Christ inside your soul, born again, you are dead in trespasses and sins. And that's the problem. We have an awful lot of people today that make no distinction between the two. It doesn't matter to them just as long as they feel good about God and feel good about God and feel good about themselves. And God's for you and God's going to bless you and God has blessed you. And you see how God's blessed you. You must belong to God for God's been. So look at all the stuff he's piled up around you so you surely belong to the Lord. The Bible said the time will come when they think gain is godliness. From such turn away. You will never get an unsaved man to understand what I'm talking about until he's born again. He'll never understand it. He'll think I'm a bigot. He'll think I'm screaming and yelling. He'll think I'm narrow-minded. He'll think I'm somebody who knows what he's talking about. He'll say, I am just as sincere about my faith in God as you are. I believe all the things I'm supposed to believe about God. He's got his head full of all this religious ideas and knowledge of God, but he doesn't have him in his heart. He doesn't have him in his heart. In an age where the church ought to be meeting more, it's meeting less. In an age when the church ought to be getting serious about God and about the second coming of Christ, walk through this town and look at all the closed church houses on Sunday night. And Wednesday night prayer meeting is old hat. Don't need it anymore. I do. If we ever lose our Sunday night service and our Wednesday night service, folks, We've lost the heart and soul of Temple Baptist Church. Amen. Tell me something. Is your time so precious you can't come to the house of God on Sunday night? Are you that, in, are you that important? You say, I have to rest. Let me tell you the rest that will rest me. That's to come into this house and hear the kind of singing I've heard. Fellowship with God's people and feel the presence of the Holy One. I get up and walk out of here refreshed like you wouldn't believe. I come dragging in here hurting and I hear this and I walk out of here feeling good. Amen. Amen. Get the spirit right and it'll get the flesh right. <laughs> it'll help your flesh. Are you telling me, preacher, that if I get full of the Holy Spirit and God blesses my soul and I'm in a, and I'm in a good service and the power of God's moving in that service that my flesh will feel better? Yes. <laughs> How many has ever had that happen to you? <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Chapter number two and verse number four. God. But God, Amen. see the but God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith, he lo wherewith he loved us. As I mentioned that to you a few weeks, months back, I don't remember when, but that's a disjunctive conjunction. What's that mean? It means it's con a conjunction means to join together, but disjunctive means that it joins together in a strange, odd way. But God, in plain words, it kind of separates, then joins. But God, but God intervened. But God, who is rich in mercy. How many of you have experienced the mercy of God? Glory to God. These folks 2,000 years ago experienced the same thing you have. But God. But God. I was going to hell, preacher. But God. I was a drunk. But God. I was no good. But God. I was no count. But God. I know one man that was with another man and they were headed to rob a bank. And somebody witnessed to them, gave him a track. And that man got saved. And he's no longer a bank robber. He started preaching. But God, I know people that had a gun ready to put it to their head and blow their brains out and either saw a message on TV or a track was handed to them or heard somebody or something happened that stopped them and they got saved. But God, never count God out. Never count him out. When it looks hopeless, that's only the beginning with him. When the door of possibility is slammed shut, it's only the beginning with the Almighty. Because he says, I open and no man shuts. And I shut and no man opens. I'm saying this. I'm saying to you tonight, there is nothing impossible with the Lord. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Who said that in the Old Testament? 
He's the father of the faithful, folks. Look at chapter number 2 and verse 13. Ephesians 2 and verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off were made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. Do you see that? For he is our peace, who hath broken down the middle wall of petition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make it himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. But God intervened and gave you freedom. This is freedom. This is freedom. I'm not a servant, a slave, bound to something. I'm free. And when I serve the Lord, I serve him in freedom because I want to serve him. I serve him because I've been made free to serve him. I'm not a slave in here tonight following in some or being beaten and driven by some taskmaster. That's what happened to Israel when they were in Egypt. They were beaten and driven by taskmasters. The service of the Lord is not a hard thing. The way of the wicked is hard. The Bible said the way of the transgressor is hard. But if you serve the Lord, there's a freedom in it. There's a freshness to it. There's life in it. There's a freedom. And this is what the apostle is talking about. He's talking about freedom. And I want you to notice something else that he, inter he introduces to us here. In verse number 15. To make twain one new man. The twain that he's talking about here is the Jew and the Gentile brought together as one in the Lord Jesus Christ. For in him there is neither Jew, there is neither Gentile, there is neither bond, there is neither free, there is neither red man, yellow man, black man, white man. In Christ Jesus, all these things are gone. Now, if you'll notice carefully, in chapter number 4, the apostle deals with this issue of unity one more time. Look at uh, Ephesians 4 and verse number 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now watch this. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, it's constant that you have these people who come along and they say, I want to tear down the walls of denominationalism and I want to, pre I want to create unity in the body of Christ. That's not up to you to create unity in the body of Christ. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. And unity for the sake of unity is unscriptural as it can be. Just to get together so you can say you got together is not what the apostle's talking about. He's talking about one faith and one Lord. Who's the Lord? One faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Here's, there is a unity that is a bond of the Spirit that if you are a true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll come together in unity for you will seek out those who believe what you believe. It won't be a man-made uh, a man made uh, contrived thing where, where you just bring people together and force them into groups together. We have people today, folks, who don't believe in the virgin birth. Am I going to be able to fellowship with these people? They don't believe in the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. They don't believe that you're a lost sinner. They don't believe in original sin. They don't believe in any of this. They don't believe in salvation by grace through faith. Are we going to have unity? There is no way. There is no way. But there is a unity of the Spirit. When you get around a brother or sister in Christ, and they may not go to your church. They may not even be, be, they may be, they may be, they may not be exactly what you are as a Baptist. But if they're truly born again, there's a unity of the Spirit of the living God, and I have felt it from my brethren. I certainly have that aren't Baptist. Yet I acknowledge freely that they love the Lord Jesus Christ and they're my brothers and sisters in the Lord. No question about that. Here's the one who gets the people together. Here's the one who creates the unity. And the first one to ever do it in the Bible was Nimrod. And he was the one who created a unity of all the people. He brought them together on a common purpose. And they got, they got together in the book of, uh, book of Genesis to build a tower and make a name for themselves. When the Lord Jesus Christ came, here's what he said. He said, I came to set a father against a son. To separate brethren. He said that's what I did. He said I come and when, his, when Christ is preached. He will divide. There will be those who join his side. And those who join the other side. You can't have it both ways. Either you have Jesus. Or you don't have unity. I want you to notice something else. In chapter number 3. The apostle Paul makes it very plain. That something is going on. That's not known to the naked eye. Ephesians 3 verse 8. Unto me 
who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now unto principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now, where did the church come from? It didn't come from Israel. Where did the church come from? It didn't come from anybody's religion. Where did the church come from? Man didn't make it. Where did the church come from? The church, first of all, in its origin, is a mystery. The Lord Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The origin of the church is mysterious because he calls out from among men those who make up his body. He calls them from men. No devil, no demon, no, no wicked spirit, evil spirit has a clue who's going to be called next. He has no idea what the real structure of the church is about. If you look at Ephesians very carefully, it talks about the temple of God and how that every stone is fitly framed together. And it becomes the habitation of God through the Spirit. Well, all these stones are spiritual stones. He's not talking about a physical building where you can walk in and see physically, but it is a building nonetheless. There's a building in here tonight that is the dwelling place of God. And when Satan and when his demons sense that, they know that there is something substantial sitting right here on Woodrow Drive right now. If a hurricane blew this building away and you were left sitting here, the church is still here. The church of God is a living entity that satanic spirits, evil, evil spirits are conscious of. Men aren't because men put things together according to, well, you don't believe this, or you sign this, or you, you agree to this, or this catechism, and blah, 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 blah. But what builds a church is the simple fact you're born again. This one's born again. This one loves Jesus. This one is saved by the grace of God. And they begin to come together because they have that in common, that they love the Son of God. That is the fitly framed together. That building that is fitly framed together is drawn out from among men. It's drawn from the worst of men. He never goes out to any secular or any ethnic or any religious group to draw his people. He draws his people from people. That's all he's concerned about. And they're sinners. And these demons marvel at what he's doing. Because the church is not Israel, the church is not the United States, the church is not the world, the church is not connected with or identified with anything on the face of the earth. It is a mystery. It is the body of Christ. Yet in that church, he is showing principalities and powers the wisdom of God. Notice what he said in Ephesians. He said that through the church might be made known the manifold wisdom of God. Well, where does his wisdom then come in, preacher? His wisdom comes in not only in the fact that he has saved you, but how he saved you and where he put you when he saved you. Because you see the remarkable thing about it is this. A demon can walk in this house tonight and see my physical flesh. He can see my physical life. He can know that I'm alive. But the life that I have in Christ, that born again spirit, that life is hid with Christ in God. He can't even see it. He can't touch it. He can't comprehend it. He has no way of knowing it. He knows there's more to me than what's standing in the pulpit. He knows there's far more to me than he can be conscious of, yet he can't do a thing about it. He can't touch it. That is that life that is hid with Christ in God. And the Bible teaches this. And this is going to be a wondrous day when it happens. That when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back with his bride and comes to the clouds and shouts the names of the sons of God and the heavens open, that we, our life, which is hid with Christ in God, then shall we be manifested as the sons of God. All of a sudden, that life is going to be manifested to the demonic world and the whole creation. His bride is going to appear with him. And until she appears with him, nobody knows what she looks like. They can't see her. They can't do anything about it. They can't touch it. 
So the manifold wisdom of God is this. That he is able to take from this world and put into another world that becomes invisible to this world and to an evil spirit in it who has no consciousness of that one. He can't trace you. He can't find you. Yet you're more alive there than you are here. The manifold wisdom of God is his ability to reach into a lost and dying world, pull a soul up from it, save it by the grace of God, and hide it forever till he gets ready to manifest it to this ungodly world. And he will manifest us one day. We will be manifested to the world. How many of you follow that tonight? <laughs> That's what it's about. Religion is all about self. It's all about the outside. It's all about parading the flesh. It's all about what you can do to better yourself. It's all about some kind of a standard that makes you look better in front of other people. When the truth of the matter is, if they ever got a hold of the simple truth that you can't see my life and I can't see your life, but my life is hid with Christ in God. And if I have a life hid with Christ in God, I've got the Holy Spirit in me who's the Spirit of Christ. And you've got the Holy Spirit in you who is the Spirit of Christ. And the Spirit of Christ in you witnesses with my spirit. We're sons of God. And that's the acid test. That's the acid test that cannot be broken and it cannot be fooled. You will not fool a child of God long. You won't do it. If you're truly born again by the grace of God, your act won't last but so long until a true born again believer will see through you and the Holy Spirit will begin to witness with their spirit and that's what I'm looking for. That's what makes the difference. It's not whether you signed up to the catechism and you were baptized in their font and your, fan, your great great grandmother's buried out in the back and you've been this and your family's been this for 4,000 years. It's a matter of whether the Holy Spirit is dwelling within you. And if he's in you, he's got his mark on you. And I'll see the mark, and you'll see my mark, and I'll see your mark. I can tell if a man's passed from death into life. You find a man, you show me a man, that man, all he can ever think about is his sins, and how he can please God, and what he can do to get the guilt away, and this bugging him, and it's bearing down on him, and it's eating him up. I'll show you a man that doesn't know what it is to be forgiven. When you're forgiven, it's forgotten. And I don't have to tell you. And some of you in this house tonight have done things that you'd be ashamed. You'd never show your face again in public. If it came out in this house tonight, if it came up on a screen up here, and everybody in here saw some of the stuff that some of you have pulled in your lifetime, you'd crawl in a hole and you'd never be seen again. But God will never mention it again. It's forgotten. And you know it. And that gives you boldness with the Lord. It does. It's that thing you can't explain, but you say, Lord God, I'm so glad you've got a bad memory. Oh, I'm so glad you don't remember it, and I ain't going to remind you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. It is. There's just something about it. You know he knew, but you know he doesn't know anymore. <laughs> and you know he forgave you because you don't have the burden. One of, the, one of the worst things to live under is a burden of sin. Lord of mercy, can you imagine? Imagine how your conscience eats you up. Imagine the burden of sin. You've done something and you're carrying that in your soul. Some of you get so heavy, it gets so heavy, sometimes you can't even live with it. You can't live with it. You can't live with it. But he'll take the burden because forgiveness and burdens go together. If he forgives you, the burden's gone. If the burden's still there, you didn't get any forgiveness. But make no mistake about this. If you've ever been forgiven of a sin, and then all of a sudden it keeps coming back, and you know the burden was lifted, and you know he forgave you, but for some reason it keeps hounding you, and it keeps coming back, keeps wearing on you. In the name of Jesus, deal with your enemy, for that is the devil, and he is accusing you, and he's trying to beat you to death in the spirit world with something that's been forgiven and forgotten. In the name of Jesus, rebuke him. Say, Satan, I've been forgiven. I've been forgotten. In the name of Jesus, leave me. Amen. 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 I have stuff pop up in my mind happened 45 years ago. Yes, sir, friends. But my mind is my mind. My mind tomorrow may be a whole lot more spiritual than it is tonight. 
My mind yesterday might have been a whole lot more fleshly than it is now. My mind is in constant flux. It's changing. That's why the mind has to be renewed. The mind is the thinking faculty of the soul. And the only thing that can renew the mind is the spiritual power of God that comes down by prayer, Bible reading, fasting if you need to, whatever you need to do to get plugged into God and begin to receive spiritual strength by doing that. And you know when it's happening. How many of you Christians in this house tonight know when you've got something spiritual coming from God and you know what it does to your mind, you know how it affects your whole life, and you think to yourself, my goodness, if I just live like this until I'm gone home, glory to God, it'd be good. But it, it doesn't work that way, but it would be, wouldn't it? That's the renewing of your mind. That's that rest restoration, forgiveness, cleansing, and all that goes with it. Satan works in the area of the spirit. And let's move along quickly and I'll come to a close. Chapter number three, verse five, he said, it was not made known unto the sons of men. Mysteries, mysteries, mysteries. Then chapter number five of the book of Ephesians and verse number nine. For the fruit of the Spirit is the capital S in your Bible. All right. Did God ever tell you how to bring forth fruit? You ever figured it out? If you have, let me know. You take a vine tree. You don't have to teach that vine tree how to hang grapes. You don't have to teach an apple tree how to bear apples. You don't have to teach a, a peach. I love peaches, man. I could eat a bushel of them. Peach tree, those luscious peaches hanging on that thing. You know why? Because it's a peach tree. It's an apple tree. It's a vine tree. That's its nature. If I went to a vine tree and found a peach hanging on it, I'd wonder where I was. <laughs> right? Fruit of the Spirit. If you have the Holy Ghost, go back to Galatians 5 and the same apostle will spell out some of that for you. Verse 22, Galatians 5, 22. Notice carefully, not fruits. What does that mean, preacher? Well, it does, it, here's what it means. It means that you can't have love and not have joy. In other words, you can't come along and say, well, now, I got some of the fruits of the Spirit, but I'm a missing out on some of them over here. No. If you have the Holy Ghost in your soul bearing fruit in you, then you're going to have all of it. And here's what he says. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Let 1 Corinthians 13 define love for you. Joy, it's joy unspeakable, full of glory. Peace, it's his peace that passes understanding. Not the peace of this world. He said, I give, but my peace. Long suffering, that comes from the uh, tribulation. Worketh patience, patience, experience. How many has ever had any tribulation? How many, I'm going to ask you a question. I won't be mean, but how many of you would like to have some long suffering and patience in your life? Raise your hand. Well, you're a pretty smart bunch, aren't you? <laughs> uh, you know what gives you patience? Tribulation. How many has ever had tribulation? Now, let me ask you a question. Did it work its work or did you rebel against it? The book of Hebrews says that if you, if, it, if you let it work its work in your life, then God will deal with you as the Father. But if you stub up and rebel against Him, then God doesn't deal with you as a Father, but as a bastard, and you're not a son. Because the bottom line is, if you can never be chastened, you don't belong to Him. Now, you may not always receive chastening. You may get so stubbed up on God and mad at Him that for a while you can't be, nothing be done with you. But somewhere along the line, if you're truly born again, the chastening hand of God will get your attention if you truly belong to him. And of course, the chastening is not to condemn you. Good night, folks. The chastening is to restore you. Restore you. If our fathers after the flesh have chastened us, us he says in, in Hebrews, after their own pleasure, their own understanding, their ignorance and their short-sightedness, how much more shall the Father of lights when he chastens you for your own good, for the glory of God? Now look at this. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. Gentleness. The servant of the Lord should not strive. Gentleness. Not going around looking for a dog fight all the time. Goodness and faith. Goodness is that is the attitude, the temperament of your life. You want to help people. Faith is this part that is so elusive to 
I'm, I'm the worst man of faith ever lived on the face of the earth. Everybody's got more faith than me. I say, God, I believe and I do, but help my unbelief. Amen. Meekness. The Bible said Moses was meek. Meek is not weak. He was meek. Meek is not weak. He had his God. He knew his God and he knew the power of his God. He knew power and strength, but he was meek. And the Bible said temperance. What is temperance? Temperance is a very important word. Temperance. Against such there is no law. What's temperance? Temperance has to do with the part where there's a control involved in it. Steel is steel. It melts at 2,700 degrees. Mild steel. That's hot. But you take mild steel and melt it at 2,700 degrees and then cool it down, it's still mild steel. But you begin to mix more carbon into it and you begin to forge that steel and you heat that steel to a certain temperature and you've got a heat range in there where you can see the color of the steel as it changes, you can begin to temper it. And as you temper that steel, it no longer is mild steel, it becomes hard. And as it becomes hard, it gets to the point where it can hold an edge. And uh, I'm no expert on how they do this. They've got swords over there in Japan where they've got 100 layers, 200 layers. They beat those layers together. They've been making them for centuries. And those swords, they say those swords over there in Japan, they can cut a man in two. They can cut a tree in two. And they're so strong and so sharp because of the temper, because they've been made, tempered. You can be strong but not tempered. Temper is to control strength. It's to control your emotions. It's to control that thing about you. You may be right, but it's not always right to let everybody know you're right. You may be right, but it's not always right to go in and change everybody. It's not right to let them know how smart you are. You're tempered in your witness and your testimony. You don't always butt in. You let somebody else do it. If somebody else is, in other words, you need wisdom that tempers you. And that's just something that we lack. I like it. I need temperance. I need temperance. Amen. I mean, what? listen, here's what I am. <clears throat> I'm a great big mouth. Just, just think of a big mouth, two legs. <laughs> big mouth, two legs, carries this big mouth around. <laughs> and then God called me to preach. And so what he did was he got these two legs with this big mouth walking around that God called to preach. And so now the Lord said, all right, big mouth. <laughs> I said, yeah, Lord, that's me. <laughs> preach so I big mouth starts preaching he knew what big mouth would do <laughs> big mouth would get up and preach but he said now son learn a few things about your preaching temper it here temper it there you don't always have to take a sword when a when a maybe maybe a brush will do see what I mean temperance use wisdom the wisdom of God the Lord Jesus was gentle with those who didn't expect him to be gentle. And he was strong with those who didn't expect him to be strong. He took a cat of nine tails and drove the money changers. They couldn't understand why he wasn't like them in profit. And he drove them from the building. So temper, yes, temper, temper. How many of you ever been using a drill bit and the thing got hot? And when it got hot, smoke came biling off that drill bit. All right. And you were drilling into steel or some hard metal. And then you tried to sharpen that drill bit. And maybe you got it sharp. And then you tried to drill with it again. It wouldn't hold the edge saw. Well, it's ruined. Well, don't throw it away. Retemper it. You see, the pot, the potter and the clay, the potter and the clay, he had a pile over here, didn't he? What was that pile? I spent most of my time in the pile. How about you? I don't know if you folks listening to me tonight. You were the most wonderful, blessed thing that God ever touched. And the moment he touched you, conformed to the image of Christ. And there's never been a moment that you didn't accept the will of God completely in your life. And blah, 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 blah. And you're the most wonderful spiritual Christian that ever walked the face of the earth. And you and God have never had a cross word. And on and on and on we go. Ugh, that makes me want to throw up. Amen. I'm in the pile. Here. Push a few. There he is. There's Lawson. All right. Let's start again. Then he starts working on me again, and everything's going just fine. I'm doing good, and I'm, oh, hallelujah, glory to God, I'm back again. <laughs> Amen. And he starts raising up something, and here we go. We're going to force. He's, he's, he's creating something. That's a, a potter is a creator. <laughs> and you take a lump and never watch one, you'll know what I'm talking about. And here he goes, and then all of a sudden, 
He puts a little pressure right here because he wants to form a crease in this thing and I don't yield to the pressure. And you know what happens? You ever seen a potter? You ever seen it all of a sudden? And all of a sudden it's just a ball enough. Picks it up, back to the pile. All right. Stay there a while. <laughs> You're used to it. <clears throat> Stay there. <laughs> he goes about his work and starts working around with something that's worth wor working with. Then after a while he remembers Lawson over there. Let's go get him again. Good night. He knocks a few out of the way. All right, come on. Pulls him back up. Sets him back down again. And he creates another one out of it. And I'd like to think that every time he does, I get a little further along before I start bucking against his hand. That's the way I see me. In other words, first time he worked on me, I lasted about five minutes. Then the next time, 15 minutes. Then the next time, I lasted an hour. And then maybe I might have lasted long enough to where something began to take shape. You know, good night. I never thought Lawson would be something like that. You kidding? I didn't know that was in him. It's not in me. It's in the one who's got his hand on me. And he'll make something out of you you never imagined it could ever be if you won't buck against that pressure, against that hand. And he'll touch you. He loves you. He knows what he wants. So, big mouth, two legs, two arms. Stand up here before you tonight. Big mouth. God says, I'm going to make more out of you than a big mouth, Jacob. He said, I'm going to take you to Peniel. And there I'm going to change your name. And I'm going to change you. So he got a hold of me and he took me to Peniel. If you've read your Old Testament, you know where Peniel is. And it was there that I encountered him in a way that I'd never encountered him before. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Father, in thy name we pray. Lord, I don't mind using me. God, I don't mind that at all. I am what I am. You know that. I'd be, I'm nothing tonight without thee. What in the world am I? Where would I be? I'm nothing without thee. Nothing. Nothing. And I give you glory, Holy One. Every good thing that's ever happened in my life, it came from thee. Everything that's ever been any worth anything in my life, it came from thee. By the grace of God, I'm not in hell right now, and that came from thee. And I bless your sweet holy name tonight, Lord. I ask you to use me now. Whatever you plan to do, this old dog, in thy name we pray. Let's stand up and sing tonight. Verse 31 in your All-American Church hymn. <sighs> Folks, he's the potter. Don't fight him. Come to him. I fought him. Let me tell you how you know you're fighting him, okay? When you won't come into agreement with him. When you won't listen to him. When you rebel against him, you're fighting him. I've done that. Done that. Been there. Done that. I had my, I had my issues. They were real. I had my issues. They were justified. I had my issues that were real and justified. And I thought, now Lord God, if you're as fair as you say you are, you'll fully understand what's going on here right now. I know you've never done that before, but I have. I can't preach for one that I, that I can't talk to. He said, <laughs> after I got through instructing him, and when he finally could start talking back to me, it took a while. It didn't happen all of a sudden. He said, son, I understand. <laughs> that in itself was comfort. He said, I understand. I understand. Then he said to me, do you trust me? Oh boy, that hit me like a dagger. Man, Ooh, I don't know. He said, do you trust me? Where's that come from? That comes from the depth of your soul. Do you know why people walk out the door, slam, walk out the church door, slam the door behind them, throw their Bible in the car and never walk back into church again? They fell out with God. They didn't get it right. And you know something? My experience has been is I've watched people and been a pastor for all these years. Most of the time, it's not really about sin. 
It's not an issue about sin. It's an issue about his lordhood, his godhood. He's God of your life. It's about him running your life. It's about him telling you what to do. It's about him opening and shutting and shutting and opening. It's about him being God. And we give him lip service and, he, and we're the Lord of our lives. If you don't believe you're the Lord of your life, you wait till it crosses God. You'll find out. You'll find out. You'll find out real fast. He said, do you trust me? I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. I just walked off and started thinking. Well, if I don't trust him, man, what's the use of me trying to preach? If I don't trust him, I'm the biggest hypocrite that ever lived. Get up in the pulpit. And... I mean, folks, my theology hadn't changed a bit, but if I don't trust him, what kind of a pastor am I? So I had to deal with that and wrestle with it and pray about it. And then I came back to him and I said, I trust you. And when I said to him that I trust you, that's when it all lifted. That's when he turned the captivity of Job. He turned my captivity. You all should be able to tell that I'm not as borne down and as beaten to death as I was for a while. All the problems haven't gone away, but Lord have mercy, I can live now. I can breathe. I can pray. I can read my Bible. I can fellowship. <laughs> Amen. I said, I trust you. That's good enough. <laughs> Sing another verse, brother. We'll close. Nobody come. remind you before you leave tonight, don't forget the video I posted on the front page of the Lion of Judah all the way down to the bottom on the left hand side and you will be you, I think you'll enjoy it and if when you log on to the Lion of Judah if you haven't been on there in a few days you'll see a background picture that was painted by a Frenchman of all people in the 1800's of uh, the I forget the name of that, Martyrdom of the Christians or I forget the name of it but they're in the arena, arena in Rome and they're all gathered together in a little group and Christians are on crosses around the peripheral and the lion tiger is coming up out of the pit and he's, they're going to devour these, these Christians. And uh, the amazing thing is though folks that was painted in France and if you know anything about French history you know that the French revolution that took place in the latter, latter part of the 1700s just about kicked Christ out of France. They have certainly kicked the Roman Catholic Church out. <laughs> you can believe that. And, uh, and yet uh, they, didn't, they didn't do away with the faith. And this is an outstanding thing. So you'll see that when you log on to the Lion of Judah. It's one of my favorites. It's one of my all-time favorites that I've ever seen is that picture you'll see in the background on the Lion of Judah. Brother Gibson dismisses.